Thanks, Father, and thanks to all of you. Uh, I'm going to call an audible right off the bat here. I got word this morning that my uh, sister-in-law, who welcomed her seventh baby home a couple days ago, just suffered a brain aneurysm. So um, we do this in community. I couldn't ask for a better opportunity. Could you all join me in just a quick Hail Mary for her, for her healing? Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Thank you. This is what it means to be a part of a social community like Father Roger talked about. Um, okay. Uh, thanks, Father Spitzer. Thanks to Tim and Mark and Rich and Fran for all of your friendship and collaboration here um, to be a part of the speaker committee um, in my role as executive director at the Leonine Forum and at the director at the Catholic Information Center in DC. Um, Tim and Fran invited me to join on the speaker committee this year. It's been an incredible opportunity to attend these Napa Institute conferences year after year and experience its growing impact firsthand. The speakers have always been incredible, beginning with the lineups built by Tim and John Meyer in the early years, and then taken to a whole new level of thematic cohesiveness each of these last few years under the guidance of Fran and the rest of the speaker committee. Napa is poised for even greater heights under the new leadership of Mark and his team, and I'm honored to have this small role in joining the speaker committee to help shape this portion of the conference. As Mark mentioned yesterday, we as a committee know it's a big commitment of your time and your resources to be here. The whole team really takes that seriously, and we want to deliver a core product that's here on the main stage that's worthy of your time. In the Bible, 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter reminds us to always be ready to give an explanation to anyone who asks for a reason for your hope. In my time on the speaker committee so far, I quickly learned a similar lesson from Fran and the other committee members always be ready to give an explanation to anyone asks for a reason for who you chose to speak. Um, and Father Roger did a great job in his session earlier today talking about how we've thought about this overall theme and broken it into these three days, this cohesive journey that we're hoping to take you on together over these three days. Um, and as someone who spent, uh, sent in a lot of feedback to Napa team over the years, I can safely report back here from the other side of the table that this Napa leadership team really does take all this feedback to heart, is constantly looking for ways to improve the conference and deliver the best possible product. So in response to feedback from attendees of the conference over the years, uh, this year Tim asked the speaker committee to explore some new presentation formats here on the main stage beyond the traditional 25-minute standalone speech. We didn't go crazy, but we did want to dip our toe into it this year by taking this next topic on the dignity of work and exploring it through a series of shorter kind of TED Talk style reflections instead of a single traditional 25 minute lecture. Uh, the second thing uh, the Napa team asked of us in response to attendee feedback was to make an intentional effort to shake up the overall speaker lineup and add in some new speakers. Now, to be sure we have a heavy dose of all of those we've come to know and love here on the main stage over the years, folks like Ryan Anderson, Monsignor Shea, Mary Hassan, Andrew Bella, Carl Truman, Father Roger, and we certainly look forward to welcoming back other mainstays here at the Napa Conference in uh, future years. Uh, we also have had speakers that haven't presented here on the main stage before, but are well known in other contexts, and we think had a really unique contribution to add to the theme this year. So folks like Noel Marion, who we just heard from, and Father Phil Larry tomorrow, and James Matthew Wilson, among others. And then Tim at also tasked us with finding some brand new voices among the emerging generation of leaders in our church to highlight here on the Napa main stage. These are folks who most of you probably have never heard of until now, but we think are among the emerging generation of leaders and thinkers around the country who are well on their way to taking their place alongside those who will shape our church and country in the years and decades ahead. And it makes sense for Napa, I think. Napa's mission is to empower Catholic leaders to renew the church and transform the culture. And Napa wants all of us to leave this week informed and inspired to go back into our communities so using this platform to empower and lift up voices in the church is an opportunity to do all of that. This year, we found some of that new talent in the Leonine Forum, which is, in short, and if I say so myself, the most incredible concentration of talented emerging leaders in the country who are committed to transforming the culture through virtuous leadership. The Leonine Fellows you're about to hear from, along with dozens of other Leonine Fellows who are in attendance here at Napa this weekend, and the nearly 1,000 Fellows around the country, are equipped with ongoing spiritual and intellectual formation from the heart of the church and provided the practical tools and dynamic network necessary to act on that formation 
to restore our culture over the next generation. So we've got new speakers, new format. With that, we welcome you to the inaugural Napa Talks. Uh, maybe it'll be our last, hopefully not. As I said, we welcome your feedback on all things. If you love it, come find me, let me know. If you hate it, Fran and Mark are right in the center of the room. You can find them soon after this. Uh, chat with them as soon as you want. Uh, for the purposes of this now, I'm not so much a moderator as a ringleader, so I'm gonna introduce all three of these uh, speakers right now back to back before exiting the stage, and then they will all come up one at a time. The topic here is the dignity of work. It's an issue central enough to the conference theme of what it means to be human uh, that we wanted to explore it both now and then again tomorrow night with David Bonson and Ryan Anderson. First, you're gonna hear from Matt Paprocki, who's a Chicago Leonine Fellow and the President and CEO of the Illinois Policy Institute on the practical reality of work as a fundamental element of what it means to be human. You'll hear some of his incredible personal story and how it's the driving force behind his efforts at IPI, where he recently founded the Center of Poverty Solutions, which is a network of direct service agencies that are fighting for the dignity of work right there in Chicago. Next up will be John Ketchum, a New York City Leonine Fellow and the Director of Cities Policy at the Manhattan Institute. John's going to examine some of the theological underpinnings of how we as Catholics understand the subjective and objective dimensions of work and how a full understanding of work encompasses more than just those things we do during the week for a paycheck. And then the third talk will be from Captain Jean Marie Sullivan. Captain Sullivan is a DC Leonine Fellow, currently serving as the commanding officer of the George Washington Naval Reserve Officer Training Corps in Washington, DC. She served as the 22nd commanding officer of the USS Whidbey Island from 2019 to 2021. Uh, Captain Sullivan is going to tell us about the profound impact leaders can have in the workplace when they go out of their way to acknowledge the dignity of every person they encounter on the job and lead with love. Uh, in addition to these Napa talks, I would be remiss if I did not also thank Lee and I and fellow Francie Broghammer, who's speaking right after this, and Mene Ukabarua, who's presenting tomorrow. Now, they're both delivering traditional speeches, and they're going to receive the full humiliating right of initiation of having Father Spitzer summarize their entire speech in 30 seconds with double the impact. Um, and you know, now that I think of it, he's probably going to do the same thing for these three as well. So good luck, guys. You're going to be great. Um, I'll end where I started with 1 Peter chapter 3. Always be ready to give an explanation to anyone who asks for a reason for your hope. Having this opportunity to introduce you to some of the next wave of Catholics, those with the courage, wits, and desire to take on the mantle as the new generation of leaders in our church and culture is a reason for my hope, uh, and we think it will be for you too. So without further ado, Matt Paprocki. So every morning I wake up at 5.30 a.m. and I get ready to go to work. But my commute is not usual. I take this suit, I wrap it up, I stuff it inside of a backpack, I take my laptop and my shoes, I put it on my back and I run three and a half miles to downtown Chicago to my office at the Illinois Policy Institute where I serve as president and CEO. So one morning about a year and a half ago, I'm getting ready to go to work and I, I hear a noise. And it's my six-year-old daughter, Fiona, and she heard me and she woke up and she's coming down the stairs and she's got her pink nightgown still on and she's got an American Girl doll under her arm and her hair is this crazy mess of blonde curly bedhead. And she looks at me and she says, Daddy, why do you have to go to work? And I went and grabbed her. And I grabbed her from the stairs and I put her on my lap and I, I smiled. Because I remember this moment when I was a kid. Do you remember the sounds and the smells of your parents getting ready to go to work? I, I can still hear my dad's electric razor. Or I can still smell his aftershave as he came into my room and kissed me on the forehead when it was still dark. The noise of my mom putting away the dishes and the pots and the pans, and for some reason I couldn't explain it, filled me with pride. And so I grab my daughter and I say, Fiona, well, daddy has to work so I can provide and I can put a roof over our head and so that I can buy us food and so that we can buy the books and the toys we have. And I pick her up and I bring her back to her room and I tuck her in, I kiss her and I, start my commute to work. So I'm running down the street, and I'm about three blocks from my house. And I'm thinking about this moment and this profound question this six-year-old girl asked me. Because her question was, why does work matter? 
And then I thought about my response and I thought, well, that was stupid, <laughs> right? Like, like my daughter's asking me like, why is work important? And I am talking about buying stuff. Like certainly that matters and providing is a significant value is, is being a, a parent. But that's like saying the reason we eat food is because it tastes good, right? That's insufficient to the question. And I keep thinking of all these things I wish I would have said, that I wish I would have told her. And there's this, there's this beautiful French term. It's l'esprit de l'escalier, which translates to the spirit of the stairs. It's, it's this concept that inside of a moment, we can't think of the right thing to say. And then by the time we leave the room or go down the staircase, we think, I should have said that. And I keep thinking of this moment. I should have told her these things. And I'm running and I'm, I'm having this, this regret and I see a man and he's on the sidewalk and he's got a floppy cowboy hat and he's wearing these oversized cargo pants and despite it being the middle of winter, he's not wearing a coat. And I know this person, I mean, I don't know him, but I know him because I run by him every single day. But for some reason today, I decided to stop. And I don't know if it was this conversation with my daughter or the Holy Spirit or both. And so I stopped my run and I went to this man and I reached out my hand and I said, I'm Matt. And he said, my name is Stephen, Stephen Blake. Stephen told me his story that he served our country in the military. When he came back home to Chicago, he couldn't find work, made some bad decisions, and became homeless. But Stephen told me about his dreams. He told me one day he wanted to be an entrepreneur. What he wanted to do most of all is to sell healthy breakfast to commuters on their way to work. He wanted to open a simple stand there on the street to sell apples and bananas and fresh fruit that for the people who were running late could still have a healthy breakfast. And I'm excited at this point. I'm, Stephen, we should do that. And, and Stephen says, Matt, I want to. He said, there's just one problem. It's illegal for me to sell food in the city of Chicago. I can't tell you how frustrated this make me. And it wasn't just Stephen, that it is actually illegal for anybody to push a food cart, for anybody to sell food fresh food inside of the city of Chicago, right? And here's a man who's standing here raising his hand and saying, I want help. Probably even more than that, he's saying, actually, I don't need your help. Just get out of my way and let me work. And this is true for millions of Americans. We have thousands of laws in every single one of our states that prevent the poor, the disadvantaged from getting work in the first place. And maybe even worse, we have this incentive structure which gives people handouts and tells them, don't bother working, right? They come in with their hand raised and they walk into a welfare office and we give them a plastic card with a little bit of money on it in the form of SNAP benefits and we tell them to go away. Right? That's how we treat charity in this company or in this country. And the problem is that we've, we've whispered these lies year after year, your work doesn't matter. The job is low pay, that means it's low dignity. This isn't a living wage. These are all lies and they are not true. But the problem is this is all that poor people are hearing in America. It's gotten so bad, in fact, that for most of uh, American existence, 95% of uh, men worked. This in uh, 1950s, 86% of men worked. Today, it's at its lowest level in American history. Only 68% percent of men are working. And I remember looking at Stephen that day and thinking, I'm not going to let this happen to you, right? And in this moment of frustration, an idea came out. And I said, what if we, what if we introduce laws? What if we introduce bills? And we worked with direct service agencies and we passed them into law. And in this moment, we created the Center for Poverty Solutions. The goal starts in the city of Chicago. Our goal in the next five years is to reduce poverty by 5% by creating work and opportunities and removing barriers. And so there, I got together with Stephen Blake. We drafted legislation. We introduced it inside of City Hall. We held a press conference. And it passed into law. Right now, Stephen Blake is currently in downtown Chicago. He is legally selling fresh fruit to commuters on their way to work. That's right.
that's, that's not even the best part. That's not even the best part. Stephen is no longer homeless. Stephen, that's right. Stephen has a family. Stephen has realized that through work he could find dignity and he could find opportunity. And it changed his life. And what Stephen realized, well, actually, Stephen told me last week, he said, Matt, I'm looking to hire two new employees. I want to hire two people, and they're going to be homeless. And he says, but I want to tell you something. They won't be homeless for long. Because what Stephen realized is something that millions of Americans who have escaped poverty have realized, that there's one single factor that can reduce poverty by 87%. It's work. Specifically, it's the dignity of work. For those people in America who have a full-time job, 80, or that are not working, 40% of them are in poverty if you are not working. If you have a job, only 2% of that population is in poverty. If you include wealth transfers like Section 8 housing, SNAP benefits, earned income tax credit, that number for full-time workers falls to 0%. That's how work can eradicate dignity. But the truth is, is that all of us know that work is about more than a job. It's, or excuse me, it's about more than pay. That, that work creates something else, right? We can realize our dignity because the solution to poverty can't just be financial. That's insufficient. There's also a spiritual element to poverty. I know a lot about poverty because I've lived it. When I was 24 years old, I worked as a legislative analyst for the Illinois General Assembly. And one day I got a phone call, and it was from my mom. And her voice was trembling, and I could tell something was wrong. And she said, Matt, I've had this pain in my stomach, and I just went to the hospital, and I've been diagnosed with stomach cancer. I, I felt the life go out of my body. I sat on my chair and I cried. The truth is, this isn't the first time I've gotten a phone call like this. My father died six years earlier from cancer. And so with tears in my eyes, I walked to my boss's office and I said, I can't work here anymore. I need to take care of my mother full time. And for the next eight months, I had the most dignifying work of my life. I had the honor to take care of my mother the woman who raised me. But we all know the pains of cancer are dreadful. And every day it got worse and worse, and eventually the pain of cancer was so bad she couldn't sleep. And so I started a tradition. I would, I would get down on my knees uh, at night and I would I'd rub her feet. And it would give her this temporary and momentary relief. And the reason that I did it was I was hopeful and I prayed that she would fall asleep. But every night that I did this, I would look up, and she'd be staring at me, wide-eyed, smiling. This, to this day, is my vision on God. It's a parent who loves his children so much that despite all the pain and the suffering of this world, he can't keep his eyes off his son, and he can't help but to smile. One cold December day, I got down on my knees. I rubbed her feet. Her eyes opened a glint. A small smile went across her face. She exhaled, and she died. I was 24 years old. I had no parents. I hadn't worked a job in eight months. Nobody needed me. I went to my studio apartment in Chicago. I opened the door and I met with turning on the light switch and nothing happened. And as I walked in, I was hit with this waft of smell. It was rotting food. My electricity had been cut off because I hadn't been working a job and so all the food in my refrigerator had rotted and gone bad. I went back to a train station to go back to my mom's house. And I went to go in my wallet and I didn't have two bucks to my name. So I begged, and I begged, and I begged. And I felt this, this feeling that I've never felt before. It was hopelessness. 
and worthlessness. And there's a word for it, it's called despair. And this is what begging does to human beings. It fills them with despair. But in the United States of America, we have a program that allows all people to beg, and we call it welfare. And I would have qualified for every welfare program there was. And I thank God I never took them. Because in America, welfare is not a safety net. It's a snare net. And the people who get caught in it never get out in their lifetime. In fact, Pew Research Study just did a, a look at this, and they said 70% of people who take $1 of welfare benefits will never get out in their entire lifetime. What changed my life? What helped me lift me up? It wasn't a handout. It wasn't somebody giving me money. It was work. I got a job. Somebody called me, and they said, Matt, I need you. And slowly, by surely, that despair went away. And, and we as Catholics, we understand why, right? We don't have to get too far into the Bible to understand what God's asking of us, right? The first five words of the Bible are, in the beginning, God created. In other words, God worked, right? He created us in his image, in his likeness, to work with him, right? He put us in the Garden of Eden, a garden that he created, and he told us to cultivate, to build on his co-creation, on something that he started and asked all of us to continue that process, right? The Garden of Eden is not a land of leisure. It was a requirement to work. And we know this by going and reading the Ten Commandments. I'm going to take us back to Sunday school for a second. Uh, what's, the, what's the third commandment? Remember and keep holy the Sabbath day. But what are the next words after that? Because the commandment doesn't end there says, for six days you shall work. Right? What God is not just saying is take off Sunday. What God is saying, work is a duty. It's a requirement that I'm giving to all of you. And the response of that is, we can realize what God's dignity is. And I've seen this firsthand. This past December, I'm running to work. And I'm running and I see a man and he's on the sidewalk. And he's got a floppy cowboy hat. And he's got oversized cargo pants. And despite it being the middle of winter, he's still not wearing a jacket. His name's Stephen Blake, and he's selling fruit to commuters. And I looked at him, and I'm freezing, right? It is cold outside. I said, Stephen, what are you doing out here? And Stephen says to me, he goes, Matt, do you see that man over there? I said, yeah. He's, there's a man begging. He's got a cardboard sign that says, please help. He said, every day I used to do exactly that. I would stand here on the corner, and I'd ask everybody, how can you help me? He said, through work? I do the opposite. Every person who comes by, I say, how can I help you? Right? That's dignity. That's a dignity that lifts people closer to the image and the likeness of God. That is a dignity that pulls people out of mental illness, out of despair, out of addiction. That is a dignity that's enshrined in our Constitution in the phrase, in the pursuit of happiness. This is the dignity that we here today have an opportunity to give to all people, to lift all people out of poverty. This is why we started the Center for Poverty Solutions. But it's more than that. It's also to lift up our souls. Right, because this room, this room here in Napa, it's fleeting. Right, not only are one day we gonna leave here very soon, but the truth is, is we're all going to die. And our eternity depends on a test that God will give us all, a test that we know the question to. Right? God will ask all of us, when I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was thirsty, did you give me something to drink? When I was naked, did you clothe me? Right? And what God, what our Lord is asking isn't just to give people a handout and tell them to go away. He's not talking about just financial poverty. That's insufficient. He's talking about spiritual poverty. We can do this through work. The goal of the Center for Poverty Solutions is to lift all people up so they realize and understand the dignity of work. So that together when we stand in front of God and he said, what did you do to the least of my people? Did you feed them? Collectively, us all in this room can answer, Amen, Lord. 
And I realized that day when I was running to work, I was filled with this regret, and I kept thinking, I wish I would have said this to my daughter. But instead, I told her stories. I told her about Stephen. I told her about my journey. I told her about the thousands of other people that we have lifted out of poverty through the Center of Poverty Solutions. And before I came here, the day before I left, I asked my daughter, I said, Fiona, why does work matter? And actually, I'm going to let her answer that. Fiona, why does work matter? Work matters because it gives all people purpose. Work lifts us up to be co-creators with God. Work is a duty that allows all people to realize their dignity. Now that's a better answer. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Matt. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm John Ketchum, and I was a sacristan in my home parish of St. Francis of Assisi in Astoria, Queens, for 10 years. Most of the time, I loved the job. Hey, I was getting paid to go to church. But what I loved above all was the way that it connected me with the parishioners the people that make up the body of Christ in my area. St. Francis was the parish of my baptism, and it's still my parish today. There was, however, one major drawback, a random event each year that filled me with dread. The snow day. Yes, throughout high school and college, instead of enjoying the magic of a day liberated by nature from the normal rhythms of life, I had to rid the snow off the church steps and sidewalks, all 900 linear feet of a U-shaped end of a block. I did, thank God, have a snowblower, although there was a time I didn't know that it had a parking brake, which meant that I was pushing the thing along like some medieval plowman. Between the curse words that entered my mind and the penance of each shovelful, I think I came out about even, hopefully. But what struck me every time I performed my snow clearing duties was how overwhelmingly important it seemed to get done quickly and how soon the snow would all melt, like there was nothing ever there. Don't get me wrong, the priests and parishioners were grateful, but give it a few days and hardly anyone would be thinking about the snow anymore, much less my efforts. And that got me thinking, what's the point of all this work? Are our lives efforts like the snow day? where everything we do in this world ultimately comes to naught and is soon forgotten? Or is the snow day the exception, an occasional drudgery that must be born on the way to achieving something truly important and objectively meaningful? The answer to this question has profound implications for how we ought to live. Work ordinarily takes up most of our time and because only human beings can decide whether or not to work, how to work, and to what ends, work fundamentally relates to the profound theme of this conference, what it means to be human. At core, being human means taking our uniquely human potential and making it actual. We transform our God-given reason, talents, and moral capabilities into the best that they can be. Now, we're all told at some point that we have potential, but without work, we remain forever stuck in the realm of the possible, never stepping in to the real. Work is the process of taking dreams and making them reality, of transforming our intention of who we want to be into becoming those very people. That means it's integral to human life and necessary for flourishing. Now this already runs against the conventional view of work as a transactional arrangement of time and effort in exchange for money to do the things and live the lives we really want. But this common understanding is woefully impoverished. It's woefully one-dimensional. For better or worse, what we do day in and day out stamps an impression on our soul. 
work works on us. We ought to know this by now. 2,400 years ago, Aristotle said in his ethics that we are what we repeatedly do. In other words, our daily actions shape who we become. Through our work, we can cultivate virtues like patience, diligence, fortitude, and courage, developing the character necessary to live good and decent lives. Pope St. John Paul II, in Laborum Exercens, also highlighted this connection between work, virtue, and the good life. Quote, work is a good thing for man, a good thing for his humanity, because through work, man not only transforms nature, adapting it to his own needs, but he also achieves fulfillment as a human being, and indeed, in a sense, becomes more a human being. Consider also what scripture teaches us. In Genesis, God reflects upon the goodness of his work, creation. Jesus joined his adoptive father's carpentry trade, again signaling the dignity of labor, especially manual labor. For Christ, who is perfectly sinless, work wasn't a punishment of toil, but the will of the Father, again suggesting its essential role in our human lives. The monastic maxim ora et labora, pray and work, beautifully and simply encapsulates this reality. Prayer joins us into communion with the eternal and inexhaustibly active God, the being that St. Thomas Aquinas says is pure act, what changes all things but is itself never changed. It's God himself that affects the change in us. When well-directed and well-intended, prayer and work conform the human will to the divine. Both make God's love real in the world to the doer, through the doer, and for the good of others. And when paired with the transformative power of the sacraments, we become more and more like the Lord, ever readier to meet him on that day when he wills to call us to the Father's house. Now with each shovel full on those church steps, I was learning these lessons, not intellectually, not in my head, but in my back and in my bones. Didn't matter whether the snow would melt in a couple of days or what would ultimately come of my efforts. That wasn't up to me. What mattered was that I was where I believed God wanted me to be, doing what I thought he wanted me to do for the people and the community that I love. And that was enough. The rest was up to him. Every day, I draw upon the habits that I learned in that sacristy the diligence, endurance, self-sacrifice, and service to the greater good that I picked up on those snow days have helped me ever since. Getting through law school and the bar, learning the ins and outs of policy, and in my community involvement. In my capacity as a director at the Manhattan Institute think tank, researching and writing on New York City policy issues, it can be very frustrating to see our elected officials promote policies that discourage work and promote government dependency. And just last week, as Mary Hassan said yesterday, we saw that California passed a law prohibiting its school districts from requiring that parents be notified when their children adopt a different gender identity or start using new pronouns. I am proud to contribute to the Manhattan Institute's efforts to push back against this unhealthy, unscientific, and unconstitutional nonsense. Alongside my colleagues, Ilya Shapiro and Lior Sapir, I've co-authored five amicus curie briefs in the various federal circuit courts of appeals, and most recently at the United States Supreme Court to push back against efforts to keep parents in the dark. We just have to keep on shoveling, even when it seems like the sun is still so far away. In my community involvement, I'm the treasurer of St. Francis's Catholic Academy, which I attended as a youngster until eighth grade. At a time when Catholic schools are closing their doors across the nation, St. Francis has a waiting list. I'm the president of the Long Island City Lawyers Club, 
an 87-year-old organization, an officer of the last remaining civic association in Astoria, a trustee of my Knights of Columbus Council, and an officer of an Italian-American social club belonging to those from my family's hometown. Are these community efforts work? <laughs> Trust me, they do feel like it at times, they really do. <laughs> but then there are other times where my day job doesn't feel like work at all. It just feels like what I should be doing to be a good steward of my home, the city that I love. Yes, New York and other American cities need public policy that enable the common good. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to develop and promote better public policies. But we also need individuals and families to build up the good in their local communities. Work is about so much more than doing a job and earning a living. It's about building a life. As people of faith, we should recognize the value in all kinds of labor necessary for the good life. The dignity of our labor derives from the dignity of ourselves as creatures made in the image and likeness of God our Creator. In his encyclical Caritas in Veritate, Pope Benedict XVI writes that the primary capital to be safeguarded and valued is man, the human person in his or her integrity. This value cannot be reduced merely to the immediate impact work has or to the wage that it commands. Physicians earn less than some YouTube content creators of questionable value. Even within professions, disparities abound. Are plastic surgeons worth more than pediatricians merely because the former earn more money? No. The value of our work consists not in what we earn, but in what we give and how we give and the good to which it is all directed. As any homemaker can attest, that involves much more besides what earns us our daily bread. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the exceptional staff at the Meritage for all that they've done in preparing for this outstanding conference and all that they're doing throughout these days to give us this opportunity to experience the sacramental and material richness. Thank you. So whether it's thriving in the business world, raising children, keeping local institutions active and vibrant, or helping those in need, each of us has a role to play in sustaining our families, local communities, and nation. But improvement is difficult individually and socially, so we need to give it our all. You can make a difference where it matters most by emulating Christ in giving your whole self in your homes, businesses, parishes, nonprofits, rosary societies, Knights of Columbus councils, school boards, local governments, and wherever else you think you can make a difference and contribute. And that's why it's so important for all of us here today to stay involved and engaged in organizations like the Napa Institute and the Leonine Forum, groups that are activating the extraordinary and energetic Catholic talent that this country is so blessed with. When talent and diligence meet the Holy Spirit, amazing things happen. After all, that's how a simple Galilean and his 12 friends eventually conquered the greatest empire of antiquity without ever picking up a sword. We're builders. So the next time you're picking up a pen to conquer your mountain of paperwork, trying to settle a community dispute, cleaning a house for the millionth time, or, yes, clearing the snow, just remember that it's an opportunity that God has placed in your life to draw closer to him. He has invested you with talents, experiences, opportunities to do good for those around you. If you embrace your work with heart and dedication, no matter what it is, you become God's hands in the world, transforming it and yourselves through his limitless love. Thank you, and God bless you.
organization with love? Can you lead it with faith that others will do the right thing? Can you do it on a warship in the middle of the ocean, full of mostly young people from all walks of life and different walks of faith? I am Catholic, and therefore I believe. Six simple words, six words that when I said them out loud, changed the way I led and how I tried to bring dignity to my sailors. In the spring of 2019, I took command of the USS Whidbey Island. And almost from the first moment on board, I could sense the terrible morale and the dejected spirit of the crew. The first day when I came on board, after exchanging salutes on the quarterdeck, I put out my hand to the petty officer of the watch and asked her her name. And she froze. She didn't know what to do. She looked shocked by the simple, automatic, kindly gesture. Almost to a person on that 400-foot warship of 400 sailors, I could sense a palpable, almost desperate need to be seen, to be loved. Life at sea is very stressful. It's dangerous, it's confined, it's sometimes monotonous, full of chaotic bursts of activity, full of life and death choices. You're operating a small city far away from the safety of land, full of mostly 18 to 25 year olds of both genders, and you are constantly on the move. You're subject to the elements of weather and currents. There's lack of communication. There is no cell phone service at sea. There is no 911 at sea. You are the 911. And so the Navy culture has developed over time a rigid adherence to authority. Authority starts at the top with the commanding officer and then diminishes as it makes its way down. There are lots of orders and rules and regulations, lots and lots of regulations. And in a lot of ways, it reminds me of the Old Testament. Lots of rules, not all of them make sense, some of them contradict each other. But it's what we need in order to make sense of things, in order to make things work. You're operating a complex machine far from any resources or help. And so over the years, as I grew in the ranks of the Navy, I would watch my bosses lead with an iron fist, lead with an Old Testament style of leadership. Do it because I said so. And so when I reached command, I asked myself, is this the only way you can do it? Is this the best way? Is this the most Christian way? When I took command, one of the first uh, things I did was to go over all the punitive cases of the sailors that were still attached to the USS Whidbey Island. And one case stood out. It was a young petty officer that had been found guilty by my predecessor under the Uniform Code of Military Justice for an act to commit a violent offense. This is a very serious accusation that results in an automatic dishonorable discharge, which is the equivalent of being a convicted felon. He was 24 years old. He had just re-enlisted and had received a hefty re-enlistment bonus which he had immediately sent to his mother because she had paid for his short attempt at a college career. So now, not only was he looking at losing his job, losing his security clearance, having to pay the Navy back thousands of dollars, and having a black mark on his record for the rest of his life. So what was his crime? Well, he had been standing an armed, roving security watch in the early hours one morning and he was very stressed and nervous because he had a promotion exam later on that same morning. 
and he was overheard saying if he didn't do well on that exam, he was going to take the, his weapon and go to town. It's a pretty cut and dry case in this day and age, right? And my predecessor was well within his rights to find him guilty of that offense. But there were anomalies. My predecessor had taken him up within 24 hours of the event happening. And normally you do a whole investigation, you interview people, you try to determine the facts and the state of mind of the accused. And more importantly, my predecessor had ignored this sailor's chain of command to show leniency. Both his supervisor and his department head said he was young, he was brash, he was immature, but he wouldn't do anything crazy. He was stressed about passing his exam. So I decided to bring him into my cabin with his chain of command, and we sat down, and I talked to him about mercy and second chances. And I told him, as a leader, the hardest thing we do is to decide where to take risk. And deciding where to take risk on people is the hardest choice you make as a leader. And then I told him that I was going to take a second chance on him. And I said, as of this moment, I'm wiping your slate clean, as though that offense never happened. I had that authority under the Uniform Code of Military Justice to do that. And he looked shocked and stupefied, as did his chain of command. And he asked if he could hug me. <laughs> and I said, no, but we could shake hands. And we stood up and we shook hands. And to this day, I can feel his whole body shaking in that moment where I changed his life because I decided to give mercy and to show love. The Catechism says, to love is to will the good of another, that all other affections follow from this first movement of the human heart toward good. On most ships in the Navy, all new check-ins go through a week-long orientation. Talk about the policies and what you do on the ship. And on board my ship, it would culminate with me, the commanding officer, coming to go and talk to the new check-ins and talk about who I was and my leadership philosophy. And I would always start by saying, I'm Catholic, and therefore I believe everyone has a soul. And because you all have a soul, you have the inherent right to dignity and respect. These are my leadership absolutes. You have a soul. And therefore, you have dignity in what you do. It does not matter how menial the task. You have a soul. And therefore, you have the inherent right of my respect and everyone's respect on board this ship. And I trust why you're here. You took the same oath I did to defend and support the Constitution. And so until proven otherwise, you have my trust that you are here for the right reasons. And when I would start this conversation with I'm Catholic, I could see the squirming in the chairs <laughs> and the looks of confusion and apprehension and is our captain trying to convert us? <laughs> but as I would go on with my explanation, those looks of confusion would turn to understanding and heads would start to nod. And dawning of agreement would flow across their faces. And a few years earlier, I would have not, I would have been too afraid to say those words out loud. I'm Catholic, and therefore, this is how I'm going to lead. And it was certainly the Leonine Forum that gave me the intellectual confidence to say those words but it was the Holy Spirit that gave me the courage. And so when I decided 
to lead as a Catholic, as my first principles, I took seriously the axiom to love my neighbor as myself. And of course there was no guarantees it was all gonna go well. I got a few wrong. A few did disappoint. But I think about the other people in those rooms when I was thinking through how I was going to make those choices about my sailors' lives. And I think of how, how did I shape their leadership formation and how their future choices. And so, of course, the ripple effects of my decisions over my time in command are unknowable except to God. But I do know there would never have been a ripple if I hadn't first decided to lead with love, to lead to, as the will, the good of another. And so in your walks of life, in your communities, in your work, in your parishes, in your children's schools, there is confusion and doubt and fear. But as leaders, as Catholics who lead others, I think we have a duty, nay, an obligation to lead with love, to lead with courage, to bring hope where there is despair, to show compassion where there is shame, to love where there is pain, and to have courage in the face of fear. And I can't guarantee all of you that it will work well. There will be disappointments and setbacks and discouragement. But if I can do it in one of the most austere places in the world, perhaps you can all try to. There is one thing I can promise. You will change people's lives, your people's lives, because they will be seen and they will feel loved. And I say there is no greater dignity at work than that, to know you are human and you have a soul, and therefore you are loved. Thank you.